Happy, happy Monday, guys. Um, so I have to commend you. If you are here watching this video, I assume it's because you have a dog and you have a yard and you are using that space to meet your dog's needs and keep them safe, which is just wonderful. Um, not everybody has the luxury of, of having a yard, having that kind of space that's all your own. Um, and I can tell you um, from my experience, having been an owner of a dog without a yard and an owner of a dog with a yard, it is really, really, really nice to have that space. Um, so, but, but yards can bring complications, right? And if our goal is to keep the dog safe, then we'll wanna think through well, we'll want to think through things, right? We think things through around here a lot. So, um, y'all ready to overthink things with me? <laughs> um, if it is your first time here, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Jennifer Malloway, and my job is to help you have the most magical relationship possible with your dog. And today, we are going to talk through the common containment options, uh, if you've got a yard, and maybe some that are less common that maybe you haven't thought of before and the pros and cons of each. Um, so let's do it. <laughs> um, yes, and thank you, big thank you to Midwest Merchandiser for sending in some video of their adorable puppy, Charlie. Um, it was a really, really cute video of her going down the slide, by the way. <laughs> um, that was really, really cute. Um, so thank you. And if anybody else wants to see their dog featured in the countdown timer, there is a link to submit some video in the description below. Um, so let's talk about some, some fences and things. Um, I got to start off by saying that there are no perfect solutions, right? There very rarely are any perfect solutions, no matter what we're talking about. Um, but when it comes to containing our dogs, the same applies. No, no perfect solutions here. Um, but we, you know, we can consider the specific dog in question, um, how big and how strong they are, um, their escapability, we'll say, we'll call it escapability, right? Their, uh, their <laughs> likelihood and an ability and um, affinity maybe for things like digging and jumping. Um, all those uh, need to be considered when you're trying to keep your dog contained. Um, so first and foremost, the, the most obvious and in my opinion, the, the absolute best option if it's possible is to have a physical fence. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to beat that, right? Um, and better yet, if you've got um, a solid like wood panel fence where something that the dog can't see through, um, is, is, they're usually taller also, is gonna be the best option. It's, it kind of takes care of most of the things that we have to consider uh, when when containing dogs. Now it's, again, it's not perfect. There, I have seen some crazy videos of very determined and athletic dogs who can jump a six foot solid fence. Um, but uh, even if you've got a, a dog like that or a shorter fence, there are some nice uh, modifications that you can make. Um, there, I forget what they're, I, I can't remember if they're called squirrel rollers or, but it's something you can install uh, along the top of the fence so that uh, an animal can't get purchase. Um, it would just roll and prevent them from jumping over. Um, so that is a kind of modification that's out there for if you've got a physical fence and a very determined animal. <laughs> um, but uh, that's not always possible. Um, there are, HOAs and costs that need to be considered and you know if you if you happen to have a lot of space too um, that could get very pricey um, <laughs> Midwest merchandise says Charlie can already jump really high we are definitely going to have to upgrade the fence um, what do you have now I'm curious um, but yeah I mean dogs dogs can be very very athletic I've seen some amazing feats of strength and creativity, maybe we'll call it. Um, it's, it's impressive, it's impressive, but we gotta keep our babies safe, right? So, um, so yeah, so if, if wood panel is, is not an option, um, chain link is, is also common and can do the trick. Um, it's less expensive usually. Um, and 
some nice things that you can do with um, with Chainlink is they there's some really really neat creative uh, products on the market now. You could just plant some shrubbery around if you don't like the look of the chain link, um, or they have these, these um, I don't even know what you call them. You stretch them out, they look like shrubbery, but they just uh, connect to the fence, so it gives it a nice visual appeal um, and blocks some of the, the visual distractions um, for dogs who maybe bark at things that they can see. Um, really, really nice options there. Hi, CK. Welcome, welcome. Um, and so, so yeah, if, if it's a possibility um, to have a physical fence, you still have options here. Um, but I know that, that um, having a physical fence is not always an option. So we're going to talk about some other things that we can do here. Um, and Midwest Merchandise says right now they've got a four, four foot chain link fence, uh, probably going to move it to a five foot chain link with slats in it. Um, yeah, I mean, how, how old is Charlie now? She looks pretty young, so is she going to get bigger? <laughs> um, CK says, I came in and you said shrubbery and I immediately thought Monty Python. <laughs> shrubbery. Um, I, it's a good word. It's a, just a really good word, right? Shrubbery. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and plus it looks really nice. I, I like it. I think it's it's really, it's nice to have. We have no shrubbery in our backyard because I'm not sure if we're allowed to plant things, um, but at least we have we have a, a solid wood panel fence right now, which I feel very, very uh, grateful for um, because Dizzy is one of those dogs who would, I mean, he barks at sounds, he barks at everything already. If he could see things, it would just be that much worse. So very, very grateful that we have that luxury of having the wood panel fence right now. Um, thank you, CK. <laughs> I'm playing around with things. Um, so, uh, let's see. Yeah, so we, we've, we've got a, a physical fence options there. It's, it's, I think it is the best option. It is the most reliable option, uh, to be sure. Um, but when it's not, what else can we do uh, to keep our dogs contained in the yard? Um, you've prob this is uh, another option that you've probably, let me move my mic closer here, another option that you've probably already seen, maybe even considered, is just having tie outs. Um, now, there are extra safety considerations if you wanna put a dog on a tie out. Um, if I were to do that, um, here's here's what I would do. I would make sure, one, that the dog's not left on it too long. Um, I would probably also be supervising um, at all times. Um, I would make sure that the tether is connected to a harness, uh, a, a back clip harness only, not the collar because that can pose a, a, a danger. Um, and make sure that however it is secured, sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll just be posts in the ground, which aren't super secure depending on uh, the soil that you've got and how strong and how big your dog is. Um, you, but you can connect them to trees. They even, uh, you, you, if you spend time on the internet, which you clearly do, uh, you may have seen some videos of people um, creating like, uh, like zip line tethers, which I think is actually really nice. Um, as long as you're not, your dog is not going crazy, um, that could be a really good option. Again, for me, just because I'm a, um, very, I'm very like overly concerned with um, safety and uh, <laughs> and just making sure that it's a good experience for, for the dog, for me, for everyone, um, I, I would always be supervising. Um, I, I don't, well, well, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, let me see. Midwest Merchandiser says, oh, she's only 12 weeks old uh, and she's a pit bull mix. Not sure what the mix part is. Uh, do you think you'll do one of the DNA tests? They're, they're just for fun, but it's always, it's always fun to see, see what the results are. Um, and I mean, she's cute, whatever she is. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, so tie outs can be a good option, but you just want to make sure that they are, that they're very secure and very safe not connecting to collars. Um, no matter what kind of collar they're wearing, uh, it could be dangerous. Um, speaking of collars, I will just throw this out there. Um, I only, the only collar that I recommend for all dogs is, is a flat quick release collar. Um, and pretty much the only 
the only reason to have a collar on is so to have identification, right? Um, I, I don't like to walk dogs on their collars anyway, so um, that's, that's me. Uh, let's see, CK, what are your thoughts about those invisible fence gadgets that can be used while traveling? So we're gonna talk about those in a moment. I know that there's a new one on the market now and they have done a beautiful job of advertising, marketing, making it look really, really nice. Um, if you've gotta go, I'll tell you I don't recommend them, but I will explain why in a moment. Um, in the meantime, let's, cool, cool, yeah. Uh, let's see, so um, if physical fence and tie outs aren't uh, the best, or aren't feasible uh, right away, um, one thing that you could do is just to, to fence a smaller area. Um, so sometimes when cost is an issue, uh, people will just, you know, or especially if you've got a lot of land, um, if you just fence a, a small area so that maybe you have a space to let the dogs go out to potty um, or they've got a smaller space to kind of run around and play and get some outside time, um, but it really, really minimizes the cost. Um, you can actually make these look really cute. Um, I was just browsing like Pinterest um, for, for ideas last week and there are some I mean, no matter what your aesthetic, like you can make these look really nice. Um, so it's actually kind of cool. If I ever had land, <laughs> I would probably consider this in addition to a perimeter fence if I had lots and lots of money, which let's face it, I'm not sure I ever will, but it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> I'm just in my dreamland, right? This is what I think. Um, April, welcome. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, so so you can you can fence a smaller area and I, I can't even go into all the different options because there are so many um, Ways to fence a small area. You can make these even uh, movable um, It could be a temporary solution if you're just like we just got to have something until we can afford to do the perimeter or you know What have you? Um, so It's it could be a really nice option um, another thing, if you have a puppy or a small dog and you just want to go really like cheap and easy, you can just get a playpen. These are, I mean, they, they make them uh, to withstand the outdoors and we use them inside, so why not use them outside, right? As long as your dog can't jump over, climb over, tip them over, <laughs> um, a playpen could be a really good option. But it is another one where I would really, really uh, suggest Supervision. I mean, I always, I always suggest supervision. Let's face it. Um, I, <laughs> there are problems that can crop up when you're not supervising, no matter how awesome your dog is. But anyway, um, so yeah, playpen could be a good option. Um, another really, really, really nice option that I don't know that I would have considered before um, is to use instead wildlife fencing. Right now. This, this category, you know, you can, they, they come in different sizes, different strengths, different materials, but wildlife th fencing, you can think of it like, like a big, uh, big strong mesh thing. Um, these are nice because they're much more easily moved than a permanent fence. Um, so if you ever wanted to expand, change a configuration based on seasons or who knows what, if you just ever wanted to move the fence, um, it can be really, really easy to do so. And um, they're, they're less uh, visible. So if, if you don't like the look of a fence, um, but you still wanna have something strong and reliable to keep your dog in and wildlife out, um, wildlife fencing can be a really good option. The nice thing about it being less visible also is that for animals, if the barrier is is less uh, clear and, and defined, um, it's less likely to be breached. They're less likely to attempt it because um, if if I know, you know, okay, I gotta jump six feet. I know I gotta jump six feet, and that's what they aim for, right? But if when you when it's hard to see, um, they're not gonna go for it as much, right? And and again, this is this is good for keeping your dog in and other things out, which can be important if you live anywhere where there's other critters <laughs> uh, that could be a problem. Um, so wildlife fencing can be really, really nice. Um, let's, let's talk about, so CK asked about um, invisible fences that can be used while traveling. Um, I'm gonna, let's talk about, let's just talk about the, the concept of 
uh, electric fences in general first. Um, now, whether it's the movable kind or you just want to have it around your, your yard at home, um, I, I gotta acknowledge, like anybody, anybody who's considering using an electric fence system has the best of intentions. Um, but electric fences come with additional considerations on top of the ones that we're considering for all the other containment options um, that are really, really important to know. So to start off, just, just to be clear, if anyone is unfamiliar, so uh, electric fences, they can go by lots of different names. Um, sometimes they're just called e-fences, sometimes they're called uh, pet barriers, um, sometimes pet fencing, smart fences, uh, underground containment systems. Um, but whatever you call it, uh, it generally works by having uh, a sensor that runs a perimeter um, and uh, a collar that is connected to the sensor um, that the dog wears that will uh, emit a tone, usually uh, will emit a tone as the dog approaches the barrier um, and then delivers an electric shock to the dog when they reach the barrier. Um, so they, they vary slightly in, in how they work and as CK pointed out, um, some of them um, are they like can, can connect to an app on your phone where you can like you can move you can have different uh, different areas different perimeters set up uh, where it'll notify you if your dog leaves um, and if it's just a GPS I really like them um, now technology can and will uh, fail us we all know this, right? <laughs> Technology does not always work perfectly. Um, so again, I would never recommend anybody use anything, whether it's got the collar or whether it's just the GPS, I would never recommend anybody use these without supervision um, because yeah, the, the tech fails. <laughs> That's, I mean, yeah, we, we all know this very, very well. Um, uh, and so yeah, it, they're, they're not perfect. I mean, again, no, no system is perfect, right? But um, it's, it's not a physical thing. So we, you just, you just, you never know. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, oh, okay. So I was saying um, the, the, the different brands, you know, they, they have different systems. Some of them are an underground wire. Some of them are rely on GPS. Some of them um, have an above ground wire, um, but however they work, um, the experience for the dog is the same um, with with uh, the uh, reaching the barrier and being delivered an electric shock. Um, and the dog's experience is the important part that we want to consider um, when you're if you're if you're thinking of of using one of these devices, um, now I, I I just just to be clear, I think you 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 guys know me and you know <laughs> what I'm gonna say here, but I am not I I would not recommend um, e I, I don't recommend e fences. Um, they they do come with the same uh, potential emotional and behavioral fallout that can come with any uh, electric shock device, um, no matter how they market it. It's, it's a painful shot. If it, if it works at all, it's because it hurts the dog. And uh, so there's, there's risks with that, um, which we're gonna touch on. Um, so I, I would not, should not, could not use them ever. Um, but I do understand that sometimes, you know, I mean, like we said, like with, with HOAs and with costs and, and all these other considerations, sometimes people feel like it's the only viable option. Um, and if anyone is considering them, I, I just want people to know there are things you got to know. <laughs> there are really, really important things you got to know. Um, and yeah, so. Uh, all right, so first thing to know. We, we did say that no system is perfect, um, but e-fences have the highest rate of escape. Uh, even, uh, close to close to 50% according to one study and that was regardless of the level of training that had been done with that system um, so it, it's it's the least reliable containment system um, I mean that that's just so <laughs> that that's why I say like supervision all the way you, you have to um, 
Uh, let's see. Yes. So Midwest Merchandiser brings up a really good point. As a mailman for my day job, I hate invisible electric fences. I never know how far the dog can go. And this is your, your man, you're ahead of the game here. Um, so this is a really, really important thing. Not only mailmen or, or other delivery people, um, but just anybody walking by, like they don't necessarily know where that perimeter stops or if your dog will cross it. Um, and it's, it's, it can scare people, right? So especially, I mean, it, you don't even, you can, you can be a dog lover and still be frightened because you don't know this dog and who knows, like, I don't know if your dog is gonna be barking at me, like anybody walking by, that can be really scary. So it can cause issues with your neighbors or your mailman. <laughs> um, it's, it, it puts other people in this situation where I don't know what's gonna happen and I don't feel safe. Um, and so, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's to, to opt not to use that system uh, in, especially, it, okay, so here's here's the other thing. Some jurisdictions, it's not even legal to install these in your front yard because of this um, and because of the, the low level of reliability. Um, yeah, CK, 50%, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, it, it was not quite, but I think it was like 45%, um, but very, very high. Um, Jason Jensen says, we built a fence. What kind of fence did you build, Jason? <laughs> um, yeah, so there's there's some there's some additional dynamics clearly with the uh, invisible fence type uh, systems. Um, yeah, so in in some counties they're not they're not legal at all. In some counties you can't have them in your front yard. Um, it's it's tricky. Um, now um, here's some ex extra things to consider. They do, you, you have to do training um, in order to use them. You can't just install them and you're done. Um, and the to their credit, the companies will tell you and sometimes they'll even sell you on uh, an additional, like it, they can come and do the training also or teach you how to do the training. Um, and, and it is important. But I think, in my opinion, they undersell it. Um, they, they, I mean, it's their product. They want to market it. They want you to buy it. So they're going to make it sound easy. Um, but if anybody's using an electric fence, the, the bare minimum you, you have, you can do is to do a lot of training with your dog using positive reinforcement, you know, um, do the boundary training with the positive reinforcement and treats and, and make it really fun and do a ton of it. Um, but here's why. So the dog, if, if you just install it and just leave it to the, to, to the collar to train the dog, there it's it's just not fair it's it's a bad experience for the dog um and along with electric shock come things like uh increased fear increased anxiety increased aggression um and we don't know which dogs are gonna are gonna have these um side effects and and to what degree um there's no way to predict that so uh, yeah, yes, CK, also for small dogs, you want a fence that will keep out predators. And with the invisible fence, um, your dog's the only one wearing that collar, right? So it, it, it supposedly tells them not to leave, but it doesn't tell anybody that they can't come in the yard. Um, and, th and that's not exclusive to pre predators. Like, yes, uh, predators can come in and, and hurt your dog. Um, other dogs can come in and start fights with your dog. Hu I mean... Humans can come in and steal your dog. Um, and there's been a lot of dog theft in in the last year, especially. Um, it seems like it's getting worse. So again, with the supervision, right? Um, let's see. So, okay, so, but but the training, right? You Confusion adds to anxiety um, and, and behavior problems that become very, very hard to fix if, if it's at all possible to fix. Um, and so, yeah, it under training will lead to confusion, which will lead to more problems. So if you're using this at all, which I do not recommend, um, but if you do choose to train, 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 you can't, this is not something you can do in one day or a couple of weeks. Lots of training. Um, Jason has chosen rolled fencing type. 
welded wire with metal posts. Okay. <laughs> That's like, I'm like trying to picture. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so, okay. So again, the, the invisible fences, they're not going to keep anybody out. So it doesn't protect your dog in that way. Um, if, so some dogs, uh, will cross the boundary regardless. Right. Um, but guess what happens when they try and re-enter the yard, they get shocked. So it may make some dogs less likely to come home um, if they do cross the boundary, uh, which is which is not what we want either. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, it, that essentially is punishing your dog for trying to come home and it's like, this poor animal <laughs> just, just no, doesn't know what happens. Um, uh, so so um, another thing that can happen with, uh, well, actually a couple things. So Some dogs, some dogs are really smart and they will learn to stand near the, the boundary where the tone will go off and drain the battery. And then they can cross the, cross the boundary without, uh, receiving the shock at all. Um, and yeah, I mean, th some dogs are smart that way. Um, some dogs will, if, if they do, you know, if, if you've got, excuse me, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> If you've got a really friendly dog um, who, you know, they see a neighbor or another dog or somebody that they want to go run up and say hi to and they receive that shock when they're trying to be friendly, um, that can over time turn into reactivity or aggression, right? Like, I, like we said, um, the, the shock system can contribute to, um, to aggression and this is one of the ways that that happens is I see person, I want to go say hi, shock, ow. Okay, man, every time I try and say hi to a person, I get shocked. People must be bad. Now I have to make the people go away. And how do we do that? With barking and growling and biting, maybe. Um, and like I said, this isn't going to happen with every dog, but we have no way to, to really know when that's going to happen. Um, certainly, I mean, and, and just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it over and over again, but I, I do not recommend e-fences would never use them um but they are especially especially not recommended for any dog who is particularly sensitive already has any fear anxiety or aggression issues um yeah so just just yeah if, if you're considering it all just make sure that you do way way overdo the training first before you try using it um and like I said, regardless of whether you're using uh, an invisible fence or a, or a real fence, frankly, um, the more supervision, the better. Um, now, one extra note, and this is for you, CK. Um, the, some of these, some of these uh, invisible fences um, work via GPS and you can have multiple zones uh, in which to keep your dog. Um, if it's not a system that employs electric shock at all, and, and sometimes they will try and use weaselly words, they'll say, oh, it's just a gentle stimulation, or it's just, don't buy it. If, if they're saying it doesn't hurt the dog, then it's not gonna work to keep the dog in. The, the pain is how it works. <laughs> so um, I don't use the ones that, that have um, any electric shock. Uh, Karen says, me personally, do not like the shock collars. Uh, I'm with you, Karen. Um, uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, so, so some of them just have the GPS and, and it'll just let you know if the dog is nearing the boundary, which is nice. Um, GPS collars are, are fine. If I, I don't have one, I haven't used them on my own dogs. Um, my, my own dogs, I have one, <laughs> um, but I haven't used them personally. Um, and they're not perfect, right? Like, it's, it, yeah. Some are, some are more precise than others in their boundary and the tech can fail, but, um, but the GPS are nice. But if I had, if I did have one say on Dizzy, um, I, if I, if I had posted videos or, um, shared any photos of him in a GPS collar, I would probably put disclaimer, like this is not a shot collar. Cause I don't want anybody ever to think that I would, I would put that on my dog. There are too many risks, not to mention Dizzy is a sensitive animal and it would be really bad for, for him, for us. So, um, okay. But with the, with the movable, uh, systems that have the, the shot collar connected, 
um, there's an extra element of confusion that is that is added or and or um, more training that has to be done. Um, so if you're using a boundary like that where there's multiple areas and the dog has to to learn, um, it's it's more for the dog to know uh, and and more potential confusion leading to what do we say? Anxiety, um, fear, and aggression. So, um, yeah. So there's there's all this extra stuff that that goes into considering using those at all. Um, people will tell you that they use them and, and have not had issues, um, and I I believe it. I mean, there's certainly anecdotes of of lots of things working. There's, um, but I've I've just seen it go wrong too many times. I would uh uh mm -mm, I wouldn't I wouldn't risk it. Um, but like I said, uh, nothing beats supervision, right? Like it doesn't matter what you have, um, to, to hold your dog in your yard. <laughs> um, but supervision is still a really, really good thing to do. Now I, I get it. Like I, I let Dizzy out and I don't watch him a hundred percent of the time in our yard with our, uh, wood panel fence. Um, but guess what? Uh, I, I have a confession. Um, he's gotten out twice, I think. Um, we, we've we got a guy that comes in and cuts the yard and our, our latch on our gate doesn't always click shut. Um, and so sometimes the wind will blow it back open and he's gotten out. Luckily, nothing too terrible happened, but the first time he did, um, I, I only realized that he was out there because I heard him barking in the front of the house and I'm like, uh-oh. That doesn't sound right. And he was barking at our poor elderly neighbor and I felt like a horrible, horrible person. Um, so yeah, like I said, no system is perfect and supervision just adds an extra layer of keeping everybody safe and protected and not, um, not letting some other naughty behaviors go unchecked, which is what we're gonna talk about next. After uh, I check your comments here, uh, April says, I just saw a famous IG dog account that just went into partnership with a celeb dog trainer about this movable fencing with GPS. I'm gonna bet you're talking about Halo. Don't use it guys, it's not, it's it's a shot collar. It's there, don't let them lie to you. Um, <laughs> I was wondering what you thought, what you might think about this kind of thing. So yeah, I just, there it is, April. I, it's, it's really, really pretty marketing on the same old product, a shot collar. Um, I, I get it. Like, I, I understand the appeal, you know, like we always, you, you, we go places, right? And it's really nice to just think like, man, I could just put up a fence and keep my dog in any space that I want to. I totally get that. That would be really nice. Um, but you know, nothing beats the good old fashioned uh, leash <laughs> and supervision. Um, so uh, yeah, that's that's my opinion. Um, I, I wouldn't like, I'd, I'd love to just, just check it out, but I, I, I wouldn't wanna give any of my money to um, a company like that. So yeah, April says makes me grateful to not have a yard living in an apartment right now, but grateful to hear this for when we do have a yard one day. And, and that's the thing. So, I mean, I, I have a yard now. And like I said, I'm, I'm very, very grateful to have the yard at all, not let alone having a nice fence. Um, but I didn't always, you know, we, we lived in the city too and with, with no yard and there are ways to get our dogs exercise, yeah, it takes more work on our part. Um, and yeah, but, but like, it's totally doable. Um, it's just that, yeah, when you live like in the suburbs maybe, or, or you just, you just have the space, um, it's, it's very tempting to just like, I just want to let my dog out and not worry. Like, I just don't want to. <laughs> um, but Guess what? So even if you've got a really nice fence, no matter what, there are stuff that dogs do that we maybe don't necessarily like, right? Like some dogs are very avid diggers. Um, some are very good at 
escaping, um, whether it's digging or jumping or climbing the fences. <laughs> um, some dogs maybe really enjoy as a pastime uh, chasing and maybe even killing wildlife, uh, which most of us do not prefer. Um, and barking. Barking is a huge thing, <laughs> right? Like I said with Dizzy, like even with a solid fence, like he still barks at neighbors when they're out there and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to be that neighbor. I refuse to be like the neighbor that everybody hates because their dog barks at them all the time. So any of those behaviors, right? In order to um, prevent your dog from getting really good at them, you have to be out there to supervise and, and nip it in the bud, right? Um, because here's the thing, the more that they do it, it's, it's practice makes perfect, right? They are, every time they do it, they're rehearsing and getting better at it. It's making them more likely to go, for that to be their go-to behavior when in the same situation. Um, so we, we don't want to let the dog practice. And if you're out there to call your dog away from whatever they're doing, the digging, the barking, whatever, um, this can be, it, it, it can go a long way to preventing those, those behaviors from getting worse, you know, especially if you like to garden and you don't want your dog to get into the garden. Now there are other, are other things that you can do, right? Like, um, I love people have gotten really created and like, made their own digging pits for the dog in their yard um, because digging is a natural normal behavior for dogs but we just we just don't like them to be able to dig anywhere they want um, so if you like designate a certain spot um, maybe even bury some awesome things teach the dog that like okay this is your digging spot yeah. but digging is not allowed anywhere else that can be a really nice um, option if you've got a dog who loves to dig um, uh, for dogs who really like chasing things, you know, playing, playing fetch tug or playing with a flirt pole, um, can be really, uh, engaging and, and, um, enriching for, for dogs who enjoy those activities. Um, if you're not familiar with a flirt pole, flirt pole, um, think of like a, just a bigger version of a cat toy. Like it's like a stick with a string and like a fuzzy thing on the end, usually. Um, and so you can get the dog really running around and moving and chasing it and it's, um, it's nice. <laughs> um, uh, April says, practice makes perfect. Yes. In our in-laws backyard, I noticed Norin wants to dig. So, uh, ways to interrupt that. Um, I like training up a, just a, a strong recall and, and use it in that scenario. Um, like any behavior, if, if say they do the thing, say Norin's going to dig, um, and you, you call him away from the digging pit, just distract him for a moment. And then as soon as you stop paying attention, he goes right back to it. That would just be a moment that I would just bring him in from the yard just cause I'm a, it's easy and I'm a lazy trainer and I like to find the easiest possible ways to stop bad behavior and train good behavior. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's, that's the easiest thing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't continue to like go back and forth and, and like battle my dog over like digging right now. But, um, but yeah, in the first time I would just train a good recall, um, use food obviously. Um, but yeah, dogs, I mean, they, it, it'll, it'll build up your recall while preventing them from doing a naughty thing. Uh, so it's good. Um, easy for the win. Heck yeah. Um, and guys, I have some exciting news. So, Maybe you have seen this already, maybe you haven't, but I have some really, really, really awesome guests lined up to come and talk to us. Um, on Wednesday, there are gonna be some really, really incredible stories. Um, my friend and colleague Sandy um, went to Thailand to rescue dogs from the flood in 2011. And she has some really cool pictures and her stories are gonna be amazing. Um, so she's coming to talk to us on Wednesday and on Friday, my friend Nicola is uh, coming to, she, she does mostly work with dogs who have fear and aggression issues. And we're gonna talk about what that experience is like for the owners of those dogs and why it's so important and what we can do um, in, in prevention. Um, so they're going to bring us some fun stories and expertise and I'm very excited. Um, and speaking of easy and lazy training, um, I'm hoping to get another really fabulous trainer on in the next month or so. I hope 
I'm gonna, I gotta talk to her soon, um, but she's like big on easy lazy training and I am so jazzed to get to talk about that. Um, yeah, so this will be, they'll be my first guests on the show and I'm so excited. Um, and you guys, oh, I totally forgot to talk about this up top, but there was something really exciting happened today and I was just like, this is so awesome. So you guys know Kong, the, the dog toy company. Um, our doorbell rang this afternoon and David came carrying in this huge box and guess what was on the side? The Kong logo. And I'm like, it's for me, a surprise box from Kong? Look, I mean, look at this, look at this. This huge box Kong sent me of all this, all this stuff. We got, we got treats and we got like a million different uh, Kong toys. We've got the bones. Um, have you guys seen these? That you can stick like different treats and things in there. Um, Tons more like of your, your Kong classics. I like, and we don't, I don't need this many Kong. So we're going to have to do like, uh, some fun give, giveaways or something. Um, but I was so excited. Kong, you, Kong is amazing. They're such a good company. And you, you all know, I, I, these are, I love these. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it is awesome. It's, I was so excited. I was like almost jumping up and down. I was so excited. Um, but yeah, like I said, like Dizzy, we have, our, our house is like full of cons. It's kind of awesome. Um, but I'm so excited. So I'm going to have to give a bunch of these away. Um, I'll have to figure out a fun way to, to do that. Um, so yeah. Uh, yeah. CK says those are great, especially for big chewers. Oh my gosh. And puppies. I mean, puppies and adolescents need, oh, uh, they need these so bad. Uh, if, if you haven't heard me say it before, like I think that every dog owner should have at least three Kongs. Um, that's yeah. <laughs> so super, super exciting. I just like, I don't know that they'll ever see this, but thank you. Thank you so much Kong. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, everybody go buy Kong because it's awesome. Um, April says, Kong toys are the best, especially because Norin doesn't tear through them. I mean, very, very few dogs can destroy these. And and did you guys know? So, I think, okay, I think we just have, um, we just have black and red in here. Oh, I have got... I've got the blue one too, but so they come in, they come in different colors and the colors of the Kongs indicate the, the strength of the rubber. Um, and I didn't know this until probably a few months ago. Um, but yeah, so the pink and blue ones are a little bit softer for puppies, um, because their jaws and their teeth are not as strong. Um, and if, it, and it can be important to get the right, um, the right texture for your dog, because if it doesn't, if it doesn't feel good for them, then they may not, they might not enjoy it. And if you're just introducing it for the first time, it's really important to like get them hooked on these. Um, cause they are lifesavers. I promise you that. Um, so, so yeah, pink and blue for puppies. Then you've got purple ones, which are even softer for, uh, elderly dogs. Um, and then black and red are like, for, for most dogs, right? The red is the Kong classic, and then the black one is the toughest one for your super chewers. Um, and yeah, I, there are very few dogs who can, who can tear these up. I mean, this is, that's tough. They're, they're just, yeah, I, I can't, I feel like I'm like really, really talking this up, but I, I seriously, like, as a, as an owner, as a trainer, like, I cannot, I cannot get enough of Kong. So, um, anyway, and we haven't tried these ones yet. This is like ginormous. This is like not a dizzy sized Kong. I think that's, that one's a little big. So I'm going to have to find a, a big dog. This one's going to go to a, like a, I don't know, maybe like a Husky or somebody. I don't know. <laughs> um, CK says, oh, Cusco had that at first. That was on one of his first toys, a little blue. And this is so tiny. Oh my gosh, you guys, this is like, like I can't even imagine, this is like a squirrel size Kong. Usually you wanna get like the bigger, the not the bigger the better, but it, when you're 
picking the size for your dog, size up because they, they, they're small. Like I think, I'm not sure if I have a medium in here, but this is like, that's the extra large and that's the large. And then, wait a minute. Okay. And then that's the medium and small and extra small. And this thing, like my hands are tiny, you guys, this thing is so, so baby. Like most puppies need something even bigger than this. So <gasps> you guys, oh my God. I'm like, this feels like maybe even better than Christmas. I don't know. Um, so anyway, yeah, that was so exciting today. I had a lot of fun with that. Um, and I can't, I can't wait to share them. Um, so anyway, I kind of got off on a whole tangent about Kong because, uh, yeah, yeah, they're just amazing. You guys know. Um, so anyway, let's get back to yards and, and fencing and things. Um, so I'm, I've, some of you have physical fences. Some of you don't have a yard yet, which again, they're great options. I mean, honestly, it's, it's nice to be able to just kind of open the door and let Dizzy out. Like that, the convenience of the yard, oh, it really can't be beat. I'm, like I said, I'm kind of lazy. Um, but when you don't have that, there are, it's not that bad, right? Um, and cities have really great options for, I mean, they've, in modern times, there are more dog parks. Um, it, it just feels, to me, it feels like there are more dog friendly spaces, um, at least in areas where I live. I hope that that trend continues because um, it feels like at the same time that we're kind of getting more and more tough on dogs, like we, we have higher expectations from them, um, but we're also, uh, hopefully, <laughs> we're also like expanding areas where it's acceptable and okay for them to be and for them to just be dogs. Um, Cause we do, we just want to let them be dogs, right? Um, so, so yeah, that's why like things like the digging pit are really nice. Um, but honestly, it's, I mean, the old fashioned walk, if you take your dog on a, just a walk, like on leash, um, around and go at their pace, go at, you know, and, and kind of follow them, like let them sniff whatever they want to sniff as long as you're not in the road and everybody's safe, of course, like that can be really nice for the dog. Um, they, they, I think that they would for the, for the most part, <laughs> they would rather be spending the time doing an activity with you, uh, than just out there by themselves anyway. And that's, that's what happens is like dogs that are out there and bored, they find stuff to, uh, entertain themselves, which is when you get the digging, the barking, the, uh, chasing and sometimes killing wildlife. <laughs> um, and, and they're not, doesn't make them bad dogs. Those are all normal, normal dog behaviors. Um, it's just that they happen to bug humans a lot of the time. So if those are things that are going to bug you or your neighbors and your neighbors are important, you want to, you want your neighbors to like you, there will come a day. It's important. <laughs> um, yeah, if, if it's going to bug you or your neighbors, um, yeah, probably want to, probably want to find other outlets for your dog's energy, um, or be able to direct that behavior to something that's acceptable or appropriate. Um, for us, luckily, I mean, it's kind of, I'm kind of surprised. Uh, apparently before Dizzy came to live with me, uh, apparently he was kind of a digger, um, but he has not done a lot of digging at the new home. Thank goodness. And again, I don't want to jinx myself because I don't want to have to fill holes out here, but, um, <laughs> he's sleeping over there. Um, yeah, so digging has not been a problem. And as long as I just do a better job now of making sure that our gate gets latched uh, and that our wood panels stay, you know, securely nailed. Um, I think there are some that we have to go check. And that's, oh, I totally almost forgot to mention, guys. Um, <laughs> Kevin Michael Reed says I do a lot of digging. Um, yeah, uh, even when you do, like, I mean, I, I've said this over and over again, but no, no system for containing your dog is perfect. Um, and even when you've got a physical fence, right? Like things break down. And so it's still really important for us to go and like periodically check it out, make sure it's still secure. Actually, uh, 
when I was still lived in San Francisco and we had, we didn't have a yard, but we had like a, a small fenced in, um, uh, just like a little patio. Um, but we had some, uh, maintenance guys out in the field back there doing some work and they knocked one of the panels loose and a dog got out and cause I didn't know it was loose and that can be terrifying. Right. Um, so yeah, it, even, even physical fences are not perfect. Um, but we can keep, prevent uh, any, any mishaps um, as much as possible by checking them out, making sure gates are always locked, <laughs> locked shut, um, as Dizzy has demonstrated for us. Um, oh my gosh, like I just, do you guys know that feeling? Like my, I mean, as soon as I, or if I even think that there's any chance that Dizzy got out, like my heart just drops. I'm like, like what could happen? We hear coyotes out here and I don't know, like Dizzy's just never been loose to do whatever he wants. I don't know what he'd do. Um, so yeah, like, oh, I, it's just terrifying that feeling. Um, there was one night last week, I think, where we was, it was like, it was close to bedtime and, um, and usually Dizzy sleeps with me. Um, and David had gone to bed already, like, a while earlier, and, um, and I thought, like, okay, I let Dizzy out, and I'm pretty sure I let him back in, but he was nowhere, and he, this dog is always, like, pretty much always glued to my side, um, and I couldn't find him. I, I went in every room in the whole house, even places that I'm like, he, there's no way he would be in here. I checked everywhere, and this dog was nowhere to be found. And I had that feeling, and I was like, oh my god. And I had to go out and check the gate. He wasn't in the yard. The gate was closed. I'm like, what in the world? But some, somehow he'd just gotten into David's room and was like, I'm sleeping with him tonight. So, so yeah, that feeling, oh, it's so scary. <laughs> um, and, yeah, so no, we, we don't want any anything like that to happen. It's just, it's the worst, like, luck, I mean, luckily, these have just been like scary moments, but nothing bad has actually happened to this boy. Cause if it did, I think I just might die. Like he's my baby, you know? Um, I got ditched. Exactly. Kevin. <laughs> um, it was just so strange. Um, but anyway, so yeah, <laughs> that was, that was luckily just like a crazy weird thing that happened. But if, if a dog really does get out of the yard, I mean, I've, I've been there for, I mean, maybe you guys don't know this. I don't know. Um, I, before I became a trainer, even, um, I worked as a, a dog walker. Um, I walked groups of six dogs off leash. I would pick them all up and take them to an off leash dog park or the beach or somewhere that was safe for them to be. Um, and I, so a lot of my friends and colleagues, uh, had the same job and, we, you know, we network and we, we communicate so that we can all help keep the whole, the whole city's dogs safe. I mean, honestly, these are like good people. And if, if we just heard like a, somebody ran up to us, like a, just a dog, uh, just an owner who their dog had run off and they were like, you're a dog person, like help me look for my dog, you know? Um, my, these people, my friends, my colleagues, they, they would almost like drop anything and search for a lost dog for, for days or have a, however long it took. Um, I mean, but the, but the panic that these, these people ha have, are experiencing, like, it, it's just, I just can't imagine. Like I would just be, I'd just be a weeping mess forever if anything really did happen. Has anybody lost a dog? Oh. <gasps> Oh my gosh, we have to talk about this. We have to we have to do a whole nother stream about about lost dogs because there's there's so much more to know and so much more to learn. <gasps> oh yes, yes, this is good. Okay, um, but I'm, have you have you lost a dog before? Okay, another confession. And this oh my gosh, this is so embarrassing, you guys. Um, but apparently this is a day day for confessions. So. <laughs> My very first 
day? No, I, I don't remember if it was the first day, but it was certainly my very first week on the job of being a dog walker. I was working for a larger company, but my first week on the job, I had a dog run off and I was so not prepared for how to handle it, what to do. I mean, yeah, luckily, like I, I called my boss and, and she was able to, to help and, and we did find the dog and, and miracle of miracles, those people didn't fire me. <laughs> um, but like, oh, it's just, it's just the worst feeling. And yeah, I mean, so at the time I was, I was so inexperienced and, but yeah, so it's, oh, this, this could be, this could be really like a really useful, juicy topic. I'm so excited. We're going to, we're going to do this. Um, CK says we found the dog, but yes, lost a dog while away from home. So new surroundings to the dog and yeah, new surroundings that, that just increases the likelihood that a dog could get lost. Either they don't know their way around or they get spooked. If you've got a, for, for dogs who are anxious in, in new surroundings, um, dogs run off. Um, yeah. So, so being away from home increases those chances that, and that's, and that's even more scary for, for the people, right? Cause you, you may not have the, the network, the resources, you don't know your way around necessarily. You don't know, like, oh man, that's, and that's probably why you're asking about those, those wireless containment systems. Um, so if, if you travel a lot maybe, or, um, if you, yeah, if, if you want a way to know uh, where your dog is, even when you're traveling, um, they do have ones that are just GPS. Those, go for it. Go for it. Maybe, maybe we'll get one of those and we'll test it out. Um, so if anybody uh, has contacts with a company like that, tell them to reach out. I'd love a sponsor, right? <laughs> um, April says, I definitely feel much better when I'm with Norin. I feel awful. I'd feel awful if he got away from me. So yes, supervision is the easiest on my heart. It, yeah, I mean, it, you just, you can't beat it. There are very few situations, if any, that like when it comes to dogs where, where no supervision is just as good as, yeah, like, I mean, yeah, it, it requires more time and attention from us, which is, can be an inconvenience. Um, but if you, oh, like I just, I just can't, I can't even, I can't even put into words like how, how awful that feels. Um, oh yes, April, thank you. Getting microchips checked regularly is good too. Getting them checked. This is, I don't, I have not even, I did not even consider that. Like what, just, just to make sure that they still work. Can they fail? Do, I mean, it is technology, so I guess, yeah. Um, but if your dog is not microchipped, definitely make sure they're microchipped. Definitely make sure that your um, contact information connected to the microchip is up to date. You know, people move a lot. Um, so you definitely always wanna make sure that they've got uh, an updated email, phone, address um, connected to the microchip. Absolutely. That, that's hard to beat, you guys. Um, so since we're talking about um, identification and um, and gear and things, um, okay, okay. April says at vet checkups you can get them checked to make sure they're active. I heard that they can sometimes fail. <gasps> Thank you. Oh my gosh. So yeah, guys. Anytime you go to the vet, have them check the microchip. <laughs> make sure it's still active. Thank you, April. Um, and, and again, up to date, make sure they've got that information. Um, yes, so good good idea to have your dog microchipped. Um, I like to have, so so since, you know, we're talking about safety and security and, um, and lost dogs and stuff, um, I am a, you know, I'm just, I'm just an overly cautious person. So I like to have uh, at least minimum two kind of fail safes in, in play. So I've got my microchip. I've got also identification on a collar. And if you want my opinion, <laughs> uh, I prefer, um, collars that just have the, um, like a name and phone number either engraved or, uh, uh embroidered, um, rather than the tags. I know that tags are, are kind of the, the norm. Um, but you know, things sometimes happen with tags. Um, 
gosh, this is like, I feel like this, okay, Jennifer, you're definitely going over the top here. But, you know, um, I have seen tags get stuck in like floor grates and dogs panic. Um, tags can, can get lost and they can come off. You know, I found, I've found a number of people's dog tags laying around the city. Um, and so, yeah. And plus that jingling noise, not only can it sometimes be annoying for people, um, but that becomes such a, such like a, a trigger for dogs. Like if, if you have a, if you have a reactive dog, which I do, um, anytime we hear anything jingly, he is like on alert. He's like, is there a dog? Do I need to, do, do I need to be on guard? Got, I got my, got my mitts up. Um, <laughs> so yeah, just the less, the less noise, the better. <laughs> um, so I, that's just my preference, um, is to have, uh, either the, your, your contact information either etched in the, in the clip or embroidered or both or all three. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so microchip, identification on the dog and physical barriers and supervision. So I'm like, okay, we're at like four layers of protection here, but you know, it's your dog. It's your preference. I just, I'm here to talk about the options and apparently get educated too about checking your microchips. Thank you. <laughs> um, ah, she says very smart to get it embroidered on the collar. Um, the phrase an ounce of prevention is so, so applicable. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'm, oh, I mean, and talk about being lazy, like prevention is so much easier than dealing with stuff that goes wrong. No matter what it is, it just is. Yeah, CK, better to be safe than sorry. You guys, yeah, we're so, ounce of prevention, prevention, better safe than sorry. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, this, you know, just we, 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 we love our dogs probably to a fault. I'm thinking about starting a group called like, I don't know, like the support group for people who love their dogs way too much or like, I don't know. Yes, I'm a very big dork, but like, I also 